Hello everybody and welcome into episode number 144 of the Bible 2021 podcast. We are reading Romans chapter 8 today and our focus is on what might just be the single most hope-filled chapter in the entire Bible. So thanks for joining us. Every day we read and break down and discuss one chapter of the Bible a day. I want to encourage you to check out our website, which is Bible2021.com. That's Bible2021.com. You can send us a question there or a comment. You can check out show notes, transcripts, and that kind of thing. As well, it's probably the easiest place to subscribe to the show. So go check out Bible2021.com. Now I find Romans 8, as I mentioned before, to be among the single most hope-filled chapters in the entire Bible. Just before the Holy Spirit through Paul leads us into one of the most controversial Bible chapters out there, which is Romans 9 on election and predestination, we're absolutely filled with hope and encouragement in Romans 8. Now, as an honest confession... This episode began as a reflection on one of the most helpful Bible verses in Scripture. Then, as I read deeper into Romans 8, it became two of the most hopeful verses in Scripture. And then, as we kept going, it grew to three of the most hopeful verses in the Bible, as I kept reading and rereading. And then, after I had written that whole preceding paragraph I just said, it finally grew into four And I realized that four of the most hopeful Bible verses in a chapter was a pretty dumb title for a podcast, so I had to change it to the most hopeful Bible chapter there is. And yes, that means I've changed the title of this podcast today four different times, and my final title might be pretty uh, lame too, I don't know. But once you read this chapter and hear it read, you've got to admit that it's just amazingly and unusually full of hopeful Bible verses and soul-stirring truths. Now, without even getting into our four main highlight verses, which we're barely going to be able to discuss today, let's look at some of the other hope-filled verses in today's chapter. For instance, verse 15, Paul says, You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Or how about verse 16 and 17? The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. My goodness, we could do a whole podcast episode on that, and I think I've done a whole sermon on that, maybe more than one. Or verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. Or how about verse 32? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Or verse 34, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He is also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Well, look, if I keep going, I'm just going to read the entire chapter. But before we do read the entire chapter, I do want to highlight those four verses that honestly couldn't be any more filled with hope. So these four verses are sort of like nuggets of rhodium in a field of pure gold. And If that doesn't make sense, I guess you should go look up the value of rhodium. Well, don't do that. I'll do it for you. Rhodium is worth $27,250 per ounce, which means it's worth a lot more than gold. And gold is great, but uh, if you have a handful of rhodium, you got something really special there. And these are like the rhodium of Bible verses. How about Romans 8, 1? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What wonderful news. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. My gosh, one of the richest, deepest treasures of theology in all of the scripture. How about Romans 8, 31? What are we supposed to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, what a question. What a wonderful question. And finally, and look, I know I'm absolutely cheating here, but Romans eight thirty-five through 39. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress 
or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, yes, I know I just read four verses, but... I couldn't figure out a way to separate them. They can't be separated. Maybe in much the same way that when Jesus was asked the question about what is the first and greatest commandment, he actually gave two. Uh, the first and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, says Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. So some things you just can't separate. And maybe Romans 8, 35 through 39 is one of those things. So let's read our passage and then we're going to briefly discuss a couple of those wonderful verses. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on things of the flesh, but Those who live according to the Spirit have their mind set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now if Christ is in you... The body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if this by the Spirit, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the firstfruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He is also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? 
Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So, just enough time for a couple of very brief commentaries on two of our verses, Romans 8.1 and Romans 8.28. Romans 8.1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Tim Keller says, A Christian is someone who lives a no-condemnation life. Nothing can charge you. Your record is clean. Now, do you know what that means? The Bible calls it peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, that's not the same thing as the peace of God. The peace of God is a feeling, a sense. It's a wonderful feeling. It's great to feel the peace of God, but we're talking about peace with God. This is an objective thing. It means the hostilities are gone. This means because of what Jesus Christ did, God is for you. His wrath and his love blaze for you and not against you. He is your ally. He is your protector. He is your friend. He is your father because, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How about Charles Spurgeon on Romans 8.28? He says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. This is a most precious scripture, pregnant with consolation to all believers in all conditions a pillar of comfort to every distressed saint. Let's take a little look nearer to it. We know. Mark the certainty and the evidence of what Paul says, which is not built upon a guess or a remote possibility, but upon the knowledge of the saints. We know all things work together for the good, partly by divine revelation, because God has clearly told us so, and partly by our own experience. We find it so. All things, not only things that lie in a natural and direct tendency to our good, as ordinances, promises, blessings, etc., but even such things as have no natural fitness and tendency to a good end, like afflictions, temptations, corruptions, abandonments, etc. All of these help onward. They work together, not all of them directly and of their own nature and inclination, but by being overruled and determined to such an issue by the gracious hand of God, they don't work out such good to the saints singly and apart, but together as combined causes or helps, standing under and working in subordination to the supreme principal cause of their happiness. Afflictions and abandonment seem to work against us, but being once put into the rank and order of causes, they work together with such blessed instruments as the word and prayer to a happy and good issue. And though the faces of these things that so agree and work together look contrary sometimes, yet there are, as it were, secret chains and connections of providence between them to unite them in their issue. There may be many instruments employed about one work and yet not communicate counsels or hold intelligence with each other. Even so, It is here, Christian, there are more instruments at work for your eternal good than you are aware of. That's just some of the implications of those wonderful promises and hope-filled scriptures we have today. Go read it on your own again and let the truth just saturate your soul. Let's close with our Bible memory verse of the month for the month of May, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Good day, friends, and Godspeed.